Hello, my name is Chuck Wolf. Over the years, I've worked in many different roles, including leading my own leadership consulting company since 1994. I've worked for and with some of the best companies and universities in the world, and have had the opportunity to work with government officials, military organizations, and public and private schools. I'm a leading expert and pioneer in emotional intelligence. Since 2009, I have been a volunteer hosting a radio show I created called The Emotion Roadmap, Take the Wheel and Control How You Feel. I really enjoy making a difference in people's lives. The show is on award-winning community radio station, WPKN in Bridgeport, Connecticut. In recent years, Simsbury Community Television has been sharing my shows on their station and on YouTube. My sincere hope is that everyone who watches regularly will learn how to use the Emotion Roadmap in their own lives by listening to people who call in to get help with challenges at work, home, and in communities. To learn more, go to www.emotionroadmap.com. If you have a comment or question, email me at cjwolf at cjwolf.com. Thank you and enjoy the show. Hi, this is Chuck Wolf, and this is WPKN 89.5 FM, listener supported radio. You're listening to the Emotion Roadmap, Take the Wheel and Control How You Feel. And I'm happy to be with here, happy to be here with you today. I'm glad that we could be together, but I unfortunately I'm not going to be able to answer the phones today. Uh, the phones for some reason are down. It has to do with something that happened with the provider in New Jersey. Apparently it was some fire and uh, the phones have not been restored yet. But I decided I wanted to come in and today's show, I want to take the time today to walk you through the creation of the emotion roadmap the design behind it, the creative aspects, and what is not obvious, but what is embedded in the model, the different theories and the different experiences that make it what it is, which is a really innovative tool to help you manage emotions, manage your own emotions, as well as influence the emotions of others. So what I want to start with is I want to tell you a bit about the emotion roadmap and how it came to be and how it works. And then I'd like to cover with you several different aspects of how I'm applying the Emotion Roadmap in today's work with companies that are interested in blending emotional intelligence with organizational effectiveness. So let's begin. In the late 1990s, I was working at a particular place on Park Avenue that was a high-end outplacement firm that was primarily devoted to helping people in the financial service industry in New York City find other positions when there was a lot of outplacement going on in that industry. I was brought in because I was known as someone who could take theoretical models and operationalize them, take the jargon out, if you will, and make them simple enough to understand and easy to use. I think the term user-friendly came about around that time. And that's what I was trying to do with models taken from universities like Harvard Business School that were developed with the idea that they would be very instrumental in being impactful in the workplace, but not everybody was going to understand them unless you could show ways that they could be used in a practical manner. And that was what I was somewhat gifted at. So I was brought in to help be another reason for this high-end outplacement firm to have contact with their customers down on Wall Street. Also working at that firm at the same time was a fellow named David Caruso. And David was friendly with Peter Salovey, who is now the president of Yale University, and Jack Mayer, who is the University of New Hampshire professor of psychology. Peter and Jack, in 1990, introduced to the world this idea that there was a new and different intelligence called emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence is designed in a way that it impacts people's thinking about the overall concept of intelligence. For years, we've known that IQ is an important factor in people's abilities to do many different things, including succeed in this world, um, succeed in ways of doing business, succeed in ways of making happy families, um, solving complex problems, 
IQ is very important for multiple reasons. But in 1994, there was a book written called The Bell Curve that introduced the idea that if you don't have a high IQ, basically, you will not be successful. This was extremely controversial since also around that same time, there was a lot of interest in the idea that IQ is basically a way of determining how successful somebody is who comes from a privileged family. Somebody who was read to, who had two parents in their home, who had food on the table, never had to worry about a roof over their head. As opposed to people that struggled just to survive, didn't have the opportunity to read a lot of books, weren't read to as young children, didn't necessarily grow up in intact homes. And when you compare people's experiences, they felt, these authors, that there was evidence to support the fact that despite all those differences, IQ still mattered, even though what gets measured with an IQ test is often information that does seem to be more available to people in more privileged settings. I think most people would agree with that. The controversy was that a lot of people felt like, well, what about street smarts? What about the idea that you could be smart and not necessarily have a large vocabulary or necessarily have learned much about spatial relationships or mathematics and still intuitively your native intelligence might be very high. And that wasn't being measured necessarily with IQ test. That was the argument back then. But these authors of the bell curve had several hundred, I think up to 800 pages of notes saying that, nope, I understand your argument, don't agree with it. He has 800 pages of proof that IQ matters and it matters greatly. And without a high IQ, you won't be successful. Okay, that's how it started. 1995, Dan Goleman, who at the time was the science editor for the New York Times. If you're a Times reader, at the time, the Tuesday edition had a science piece that was included. And part of that was Dan Goleman writing about psychological research. Dan's a brilliant writer, a good friend at this point, and somebody who actually has impacted the world profoundly by bringing our attention to this idea of emotional intelligence. Dan was researching, uh, looking at other people's research rather, of many different psychologists, and he would write about their work in the newspapers. Well, he'd come across Jack and Peter's article on emotional intelligence, and he'd written about that, but he'd also written about many other people's ideas about but later became called social and emotional competencies. Dan had enough information over the years that he collected that he thought he wanted to write a book. And as he went to his publisher with a draft of many of the different articles that he had written so beautifully and made so available to the average reader that the publisher thought, Dan, I like your book a lot, but I'm thinking that maybe if we called it emotional intelligence, because Dan was considering a number of different titles, and we added the subtitle, why it matters more than IQ or might matter more than IQ, I think we'll get a lot of attention because of all the controversy surrounding the bell curve. As I mentioned, the bell curve was written in 1994. And actually the authors received many death threats because of the controversy surrounding the book, saying IQ is all important. And the publisher thought if Dan wrote a book with a title saying something like emotional intelligence, why it matters more than IQ, or why it might matter more than IQ, that uh, we're going to get a lot of publicity, Dan, without even having to pay for it. And the publisher was right. <laughs> for years, uh, people would joke that Dan not only was knowledgeable about emotional intelligence, but he was brilliant at promotional intelligence, by naming it that. Anyway, he had talked with Peter and Jack about writing that, um, uh, using their title, because that was the title of their article in 1990. And uh, Peter and Jack went along with it. What they had, didn't do was they didn't read Dan's draft. And Dan's draft, because it was about a lot of different researchers' work, didn't really talk much about the idea of emotional intelligence, even though that was in the title. So the field emerged somewhat confused, still is today. There are a lot of different definitions out there about emotional intelligence. Basically, the, the way to think about emotional intelligence, I think that perhaps is most useful, is to consider that emotional intelligence is our ability to identify emotions in ourselves and others, to use emotions effectively for what we're trying to get done, 
To understand how emotions work so that we know how we might change them if we need to, and to manage emotions, our own emotions, and to manage or at least influence other people's emotions. That's, I think, a very useful way, and most people would accept. That does sort of describe what we're talking about when we say emotional intelligence. Well, because Dan became very successful in publishing his book, became a bestseller, and uh, that, uh, there was a huge outcry for Dan to do something more with what he had written about. Can we somehow use this in schools, in industry, in government, in the military? And is, there, can, is there any place that we can use it? What would we do if we wanted to make people more emotionally intelligent? How would we grow those skills if it's possible to grow them? And Dan worked then with another friend of mine today, Richard Boyatzis. And Richard was known for being very famous for his work on competencies. Richard was one of the founders of the whole idea that competencies also matter in the workplace and that it's important to understand what competencies you're looking for when you're hiring leaders, when you're hiring workers, what are the technical competencies, what are the leadership competencies, and so forth. And Richard was one of the forerunners on that. So Richard combined some of the work that he was extremely knowledgeable about and expert in with the work that Dan was uncovering about emotional intelligence. And they produced something that's now called the Emotional and Social Competency Inventory that measures emotional and social competencies. Now, at the same time, Peter Salovey and Jack Mayer began working with their friend and colleague, David Caruso. All three of them are psychologists, and David was working, as I mentioned, in the same firm that I was in, in Park Avenue in New York City. David um, had heard about me, and he thought, perhaps with my background, uh, having worked at Harvard Business School and then being known as someone very um, successful at translating theory into practice, that perhaps I could be helpful to, Dan, uh, to David and to Jack and to Peter with what they were doing, which was they wanted to show the world that they could measure emotional intelligence abilities the way they described them. They basically said that emotional intelligence is, similar to my definition, the ability to identify, use, understand, and manage emotions. Identify, use, understand, and manage emotions. That each of us has these abilities, and we have differences in our abilities in these areas, and those differences matter. They were publishing what they called the Multi-Factor Emotional Intelligence Scale, and they asked if I would be their publisher and also work with them to help make it come alive so people could use the information they could gain once they knew what their emotional abilities were. So I helped them at that point to write a certification program for the test that they had created. I worked closely with David. We co-authored the uh, Multi-Factor Emotional Intelligence Scale Certification Program, and then we did the same thing with the Mesquite, which was later the publisher MHS out of Toronto, which is a well-known publisher of psychological instruments, that uh, we co-wrote the certification program for them as well. That's the version that's out today, the Mesquite 2.0, Mayor Salve Crusoe Emotional Intelligence Test. That's what Mesquite stands for. Hopefully, there's a new version of it coming up in, in the days to come. But in any case, that was a magnificent test for really assessing people's emotional abilities. Still is. What it didn't do was tell people what to do now that you knew that you were strong, let's say, in identify, strong perhaps in use, okay in understand, but maybe low in manage. That's just one possibility of many. But when you found out what your scores were, what could you do about it? They asked for my help, and that's where the Emotion Roadmap came into play. I began to look at the Emotion Roadmap as a series of questions, a thought process that was designed to help people think through what was happening to them emotionally. Over time, as I work with them, I realized that in a lot of my interactions with leaders, high-level leaders, as well as middle managers, supervisors, and just anyone in general that I might be working with, I found that smart people often were stuck when they had emotions that were strong inside themselves, that were holding them back from making decisions, that were creating uncertainty, doubt. There was a lot of concern about what was happening internally, and if they were working with somebody else, 
Sometimes they were very worried about what they might need or think they had to say or do in terms of how it was going to impact other people's emotions. These other people might be people that were loved ones. It could be something in the home or it could be somebody at work, somebody that's really important to you, like somebody you report to or a peer or an, a senior vice president in another part of an organization that you might have to deal with and you were worried about the emotional impact of what you were supposed to get done in terms of how it would be heard or experienced by the person you needed to talk to or deal with. So I began to realize that if you were stuck and emotions were somehow at the root, the root cause perhaps of why you were stuck, that it impacted your ability to problem solve. Excellent critical thinkers got stuck when emotions were involved, I found. So I began to think about how Socrates might deal with this. I was always intrigued with the idea that Socrates help people to uncover really interesting beliefs that were at the root of some of the things that they said or did. And he helped them to process through, through a series of questions, where those beliefs came from and whether they were really founded on rational thought. Now, Socrates did it in a way that often made people upset, and I didn't want to do that. <laughs> so I began to think, well, perhaps I don't want to do it exactly like Socrates did, but Maybe I could combine some of the things I thought were important to, to, to deal with helping people solve complex, challenging problems um, or maybe opportunities that they were uh, challenged to, to get done by looking at just the focus on emotions. So I said to people, tell me your situation. Now, these are often clients. I ask them, tell me about your situation. And then let me ask you, how are you feeling about the situation right now. Is there anybody else involved or is this something internal just to you? If it was more than them, I say, well, okay, if there's more people involved, who actually is key? Who is key to what's involved? And once I identified a couple of people perhaps that were key as well as the person themselves, I'd ask them, okay, tell me how each of the key people also are feeling about the circumstance or situation or what you're afraid that they might feel when you present what you need to present to them. So we'd get a current state. And then I'd been trained over the years in change management or transformational change. And I had learned that you want to think about change as identifying the current state and then creating a compelling vision for a future state. Part of what helps change to work is having a real compelling and somewhat clear vision of what you want to change to. Having said that, when you think about what you want to change to, I ask them, what feelings do you want to change to? So if you're feeling something right now that's confounding you, causing you to feel doubtful or uncertain about how to proceed, and you're worried about the feelings with other people that you need to negotiate with or deal with, and you know, or at least you have a pretty good guess about what the others are feeling as well, I realize it's hypothetical, but you probably know somewhat about what you think they're feeling. And it's probably somewhat accurate. But you always want to realize that it may not be accurate. But still, you want to start with a hypothesis that you can test. So you identify how you're feeling and anyone who's key, how he or she or they is feeling. Then I ask, what would be ideal to feel? So it's current state and future state. What would be ideal to feel for you and for each of them? I'd be different may not be the same. Now you understand what it is that you're feeling. And I like to use the example, if you're a regular listener to the radio show, you know that I like to talk about the idea that feelings, current feelings, are, are a good example of a current feeling that people can identify with is anxious. So if you're feeling anxious and you want to feel confident how do you get there? Now, that's an example that most people can identify with because I think there are many times in life that most of us, if not all of us, feel anxious and wish that we could feel confident. Now, lots of times the stakes aren't high and we just proceed and we hope for the best. But sometimes the stakes matter quite a bit and it's very consequential what's going on. And so we really want to get this right. And so I ask people, if you're feeling anxious, this is an example of how this works, and you want to feel confident, how do you get there? And one of the things that I built into the model, into my roadmap, was this idea of appreciative inquiry. 
Now, appreciative inquiry is not something a lot of people know about, but it's this idea of recognizing and building on previous strengths. That's a part of it. And so I'll ask a person that I'm coaching or working with, trying to help, if you're feeling anxious and you want to feel confident and you're really, really worried about it because this is a really important event for you, let me see if I can help you by asking you this question. Do you remember any time in your life, in your past experience, recent or a long time ago, where you also felt very anxious and it was, again, a very important consequential um, circumstance that you were dealing with? Again, it might be very different than what you're facing today, but nevertheless, the feelings were similar and it was very important to you also. And if somebody can remember a time in their life where they had been anxious and became confident and realized that at the time, because of the way I asked the question, they didn't know that they could become confident, but they actually were able to make it happen, something internally changes for them. Something changes in the way that they start to feel like this may not be as impossible as I first thought. This actually might be doable because if I look at my past, I was able to do this before. Not the same circumstance, the situation is very different, but the feelings were the same. Now, I will ask my next question based on appreciative inquiry. Is there any way that you could take what you did back then and make it useful for right now? Is that a possibility? Often it is. Now, what happens in that moment when I ask the question that way is people process it. And they begin to, instead of feeling helpless, feel a tiny bit hopeful. I ask them to tell me about the circumstance. And as we explore what they did in the past, I ask them to see, is there a takeaway here that you could use in this current situation? And I help them with that. But what's unique about the circumstances, instead of me as an expert telling them how to deal with anxiety and turn it into confidence because of all the things I've learned about how you do that, and I have lots of expert ways to tell people to do that. Instead, I'm working with them on building a plan based on their experience. In other words, it's their plan I'm helping them with. It's not my plan that I'm trying to get them to do. So that's where appreciative inquiry is part of the model. And then in understanding, I think one of the key things in understanding that is a built-in factor as well is what is it you're feeling and why are you feeling that way is about root cause and problem solving. So that's where the problem solving model kicks in. I sometimes refer to the emotion roadmap as emotion-based problem solving because you use the problem solving methodology, which basically says, what's the root cause and how do I work with that root cause to change it? It often takes very different turns depending on what we're talking about. But if you look at a methodology for problem solving, Basically, you can just follow it and think about emotions that you want to change as a problem to be solved. And that's where I help people with that part. So we go from, if you want to turn from being anxious for yourself to feeling confident, and you understand the reason for your anxiety, it's perhaps because you're unprepared or you haven't, um, you, you don't know enough about the person you're going to be talking to if it involves somebody else and how they might react, or you've heard some things that concern you about the other person. So you start thinking and planning to, how do I learn more about the other person? How do I learn what they might like about what I'm going to say and what they might be challenged by? How, what's the best way I can involve them and tell them about it? Can I reach out to other people that might also be able to influence them before I ever have the conversation? For myself, are there some ways for me to prepare more? Is there a way for me to do some things that I haven't already done that make me feel less anxious that are going to make me feel more confident? And we start to explore all kinds of options. And then in the management piece, I basically just simply ask people of the strategies we come up with together, of those strategies, which one, if any, are you actually able to do? Do you really think you have the competency to do? And let's say there's more than one. There may be several. Okay, so you've got a couple or three strategies or only one that actually feels like you're really, able, you're really able to do it. So once you have a strategy that you feel like you are able to do, the second question is, are you willing? 
And now that might sound like a strange question because of course you're willing because you have a problem to solve and now you just figured out there's something you can do to solve it, right? Not always. It's really curious, but sometimes there are certain things that we are just unwilling to do, even if it solves a challenging problem for us. Once I recognize that, I might see if there's some ways to get you to be more willing, but it's not a good use of our time usually. Instead, I'll try and say, okay, is there another one that you actually are willing to do and you're also able to do? And if we've got one that actually you can answer, yes, I'm willing and yes, I'm able, we have an emotion-based plan. And you are feeling hopeful and you're really feeling thankful. And that's how the emotion roadmap works. So it combines change management theory. It combines problem-solving methodology. It combines appreciative inquiry. And it combines emotional intelligence theory. And it all happens with four questions. How are you feeling now about the situation? What would be ideal to feel? How can we get from what you are feeling to what's ideal? And what are you willing and able to do? So that's the emotion roadmap. I hope that's helpful to you to understand why it's important to actually spend some time with a format, an innovative tool, a technique, um, a process, if you will, that logically walks you through how to change feelings, the feelings that are more useful and more helpful. Also, I just want to close this segment by saying that it's important to understand that whatever you are feeling should not be ignored, even if it's not helpful in the moment. It's Feelings are a part of our evolutionary system. They are designed to inform us, to protect us, to defend us, to help us, to support us. So it's always important to recognize why we're feeling anxious. And if you follow through that whole conversation I just presented about how emotions work and how you might deal with anxiety, that's something that's useful in lots of circumstances, lots of the time. And it's based on starting with, yes, I recognize we're feeling anxious. It's important to recognize the feeling. I'll mention one other just caveat here, and that is sometimes we're feeling something that prevents us from being effective, even when we already thought we were prepared and ready to go, and potentially we're going to be effective in a a situation. And I like to use the example of a keynote. I've been in situations where... I've been a keynote presenter for a group where I'm a motivational speaker or I'm explaining how emotional intelligence can be helpful to them in their professional and personal lives. Or I'm there to talk about advancement of people in, uh, from minority groups or women into leadership roles. Uh, lots of different topics I'll talk about and enroll in the idea of emotional intelligence and how it plays a role. Uh, but sometimes... We, our, our pursuit of, of, of success and, and performance and perfection gets interrupted by life. Life happens. And we might just have got a phone call right before we're going on stage, which has happened to me, where something very negative has happened to somebody I care about. Um, job loss, car accident, something that changes everything about what I'm feeling. And somehow I have to find a way to compartmentalize that, put that aside somehow in my brain in a little box somewhere, knowing that I'm going to have to deal with that, but I can't deal with it now because now I'm here to help a whole bunch of people, sometimes hundreds of people, even thousands of people in an audience in front of me or online to feel that they have a new way of thinking about managing their emotions that will be meaningful to them throughout their lives should they adopt it. Okay, so now I'd like to move on to a second topic, which is basically this idea that I want to use emotional intelligence in my emotion roadmap in ways that make the world a better place. One of the things I really enjoy is helping people and making lives more meaningful and better somehow because of something I might be able to do or say or add to a person's life. One of the things that is happening recently is that I'm working with a client on combining emotional intelligence with organizational effectiveness. And I had the privilege of working with someone on organizational effectiveness named Tony Athos, who was probably the most brilliant man 
I have ever met and one of the most brilliant people to ever live, I think, on this planet. Recognized as one of the world's greatest college teachers by Time Magazine back when he was a professor at Harvard Business School. And also recognizes the key person in the entire organization behavior department uh, <clears throat> for Harvard Business School for the dean at the time. Tony was asked to help McKinsey and Company, the uh, very successful consulting company that has done tremendous work on transformational change. In 1980, he was working with Tom Peters and a couple of other people to help create what was called the 7S model of organizational effectiveness. The 7S model of organizational effectiveness has as its heart, initially had it at its heart, something Tony called superordinate goals. Now, superordinate was a word that basically meant that it, rise, it rises above any other goals. It may not even be talked about or written about or even well understood except by the people that run and drive or own the company. It's something that they care passionately about and sometimes may have a hard time expressing themselves or maybe they don't even want to talk about. But the point is that whatever it is that's most important to the organization, at the heart of the organization, why it exists, Tony called superordinate goals. And he said, if we want to find ways to transform how we address those superordinate goals, we have to impact what he called the six other S's. Again, it's a seven S model. At the heart was superordinate goals. And he said the other S's were hard S's, he called them, for strategy. What's the organization's strategy? What is the structure? What is the organization's structure? What are the systems that exist in the organization? And then soft S's. What are the skills, style, and staff? Of an organization. Later in life, Tony told me many years later, after the model was given to McKenzie in around 1981-82, that he wished he had had one more S. <laughs> he, and, but it was an S that circled the whole model. What he felt he needed and what the organizations that used the model needed was a strategy for this strategy. A strategy for systems a strategy for structure, a strategy for skills, a strategy for style, a strategy for staff. In other words, what are our plans for all these things to happen to make sure that we are effectively achieving our superordinate goals? Over time, the model, by the way, the model still exists and this is 1980 and it's still being used by McKenzie and others. Um, and one of the things that he felt also over time was that at times people struggled with superordinate goals. And while he initially resisted the change, it did eventually get changed to shared values. Now, what's interesting about shared values is that shared values are often something that you'll see. If you walk into a company, you'll see a plaque on a wall and the, and, and the plaque might say, uh, here are our shared values, integrity, uh, inclusiveness, um, uh, co um, concern for others, um, respect, appreciation. Lots of different things could be on that value chain. or the, Not the value chain, but value list of what we care most about in this organization. In fact, an interesting thing to think about, and you might stop and ask yourself this, is what is it that you might think would be the most sought after value by team members and organizations or employees and organizations if you asked any employee in any organization you knew, what do you think is the most important value that this organization should cherish, should always make sure is happening? What do you think one of those most important values should be? What's the key one for you? Now, there's lots of different choices. I ask somebody, uh, I often ask people that. And some people say honesty. Some people say integrity. Some people say um, ethical. Um, those are all sort of in one, one group. Then there's the appreciation and valued uh, group. And there's, there's a lot of different ones that people might come up with. I'm not sure what you think. What would you think? As you're thinking about that, I will tell you what they actually chose. Now, there's just not a lot of research on this, but there was an article I saw that basically said that when people are asked, what would they think is the most important value? They say respect. 
Now you might ask yourself, I wonder why respect. I mean, respect's a good one, and I, but why not? Why not some of the others? Well, I think perhaps, and this is just my assumption. It's not based on research. I think respect is said so often because so many people feel disrespected in their organizations. Does that ring true for a lot of you? I'm guessing it does. But I always struggle with the idea about shared values being on a plaque, in a perhaps a little card in your wallet, or um, a plaque on your desk, or a poster on the wall in your organization somewhere. And that's it. What are we really doing to make sure we have those values in place? So recently, I conceived of the idea of merging the 7S model with emotional intelligence and with emotions. And I thought, what if we change the model from shared values and said shared feelings? What if we said we want feelings to be at the heart of the model? We want to think about feelings for people in our organization. We want to think about the people's families of people in our organization. We want to think about the feelings of our customers. We want to think about the feelings of our vendors. And finally, we want to think about the feelings of our communities where we live and work. How could that be beneficial to the organization, to its effectiveness, to its productivity, to its profitability, to the levels of trust and engagement in that organization? How could these be helpful? Is it soft and mushy or is it really powerful and strong to talk about feelings and how they impact an organizational success or lack of success? I began to think about what would I call this initiative? I thought of the word Eros the God of love. <laughs> doesn't sound like a business term. It stands for Emotion Roadmap for Organizational Success. E-R-O-S. And the symbol is an arrow with the heart at the end of it. We want to target all these different constituencies. Our team members, their families, our customers, our vendors, and our community. And we want to target them and hit them with this arrow with a heart at the end of it. That's the way I think about this measure, is how do we communicate this? How do we get this done? What does this look like? What does this feel like? How does this impact us and the people around us? So I'd like to talk to you about that too. So one of the ways I'd like to think about this is to start with team members. There isn't a company out there that doesn't say at some level in writing or somewhere in a speech somehow, people are our greatest asset. But all of you that are listening to me today know that not all companies really believe that, despite the fact they say it. At least not in terms of how they treat their people. Interestingly, I struggle, again, language is important to me, and I struggle with the word human capital. It's a very prominent word that's used by business people to talk about people, the people part of their business is human capital. It makes it more business-like, they think. I think it deflects from the compassion we want to feel for people when you call them capital. It's like they're replaceable parts. Individually, they don't matter. I struggle with human capital as a term. Employees is okay, but it's neutral. One of my colleagues, John Caparella, one of the best leaders I've ever known, he is introduced to his organizations wherever he's been a leader. One of the places I have some interviews with John that I've done in the past, um, when he was the president of the, um, the couple of hotels in Las Vegas and also the, uh, the Sands Convention Center. Uh, the Palazzo and Venetian Hotels are two beautiful properties on the Strip. And John was the president of those two with the Sands Convention Center for a period of time. And, uh, and he talks about his people. There were 10,000 people in that organization. He talks about them as team members. That's his team at the time. If he had a small group when he was a quality manager, the inner circle of Boston and in, uh, in Baltimore and in, in the inner harbor, uh, or when he was a uh, general manager for uh, a property called the Opryland. Uh, I mean, uh, he wasn't a general manager. He was the uh, chief operating officer for 
the Opryland and several other um, parts that are now part of Marriott's. But anyway, John has had a great leadership career and he calls the people, whatever size group, his team members because of what it makes them feel like to know that they're part of a team. It creates that feeling of belonging. I belong to something when I'm part of a team. When I'm an employee, I'm one step <laughs> removed from human capital perhaps, but I don't feel very special about being an employee. I might be proud of my organization and still be seen as an employee, but nevertheless, when I feel like I'm a team member, it carries a different emotional weight. So that's part of how you think about employees or team members or human capital, whatever term you're using, think about the impact the term you use has on the feelings of those people. Now, why is it important that people, for instance, feel trust in the organization? And how do you generate trust? How do you generate engagement? Well, you hear a lot these days about transparency. You hear about a lot in terms of government <laughs> and whether it's transparent or not. Usually it isn't, but at least in terms of some of the leaders like John that I've worked with over the years, being transparent, letting people know where we stand. When they feel like they're not necessarily owners of the organization, but they're team members of the organization, they want the organization to, to achieve. They want the organization to succeed. And one of the ways you get them to do that is telling them where we are, telling them the things that are leading us to success. Some of our failures, being open about what we've done that isn't right, hasn't worked, and how we need to correct it. When we don't hit the numbers we're supposed to hit, how do we clean that up? How do we make that better? Really important that people allow the people that they call hopefully team members to understand where are we now and how does your part of what you contribute to the organization make a difference? And how do you doing your part make a difference? What is it that you might change that will make a difference? And as you look at all the different pieces in organizational life, as you think about it, what is our strategy for teams? You can call them staff. What is our strategy for team members to feel engaged, to feel trusting? Often, John was in the hospitality business and I did some research over the years um, that I shared with him that showed that when people feel more trusting of their organization, telling them what's going on, involving them, helping them to be part of the team that solves problems, not just being told what to do and how to do it. And, you know, uh, whether they come in or don't come in and don't without any, ever understanding why changes are happening. Uh, when people feel more engaged, more a part of the team and feel trusting, productivity and profitability levels are significantly better than organizations where that's not happening. There's a lot of research on trust. If you want to go out and look at the articles, when people feel like they can trust their organization, particularly the person they work for, that's so key. So many people don't leave an organization, they leave a person. I know you're leaving your company when you say you resign, but often you're resigning from the person you work for. You don't have a big issue, or maybe you do, but often the biggest issue you have is with the person who is directly responsible for your performance that you report to. So what can leaders and supervisors do to be more open and supportive of their employees? There's a lot of talk about empathy. And so when I think about team members, I think about empathy. How important is empathy in the workplace? Again, sounds soft to you, then you're thinking wrong. Empathy is not easy because empathy shows up in several different ways. The key way we think about empathy often is, do we feel what somebody else feels? Also, very important empathy is do we understand why somebody feels the way they do? So one is intellectual empathy, which is this ability to understand why somebody feels the way they do. Emotional empathy, which is to feel what somebody else is feeling. But then actually Dan Goleman introduced me to this idea of empathic concern. He said there's a third way to think about empathy and that's empathic concern. Concern for others and concern for how they feel. And I thought empath empathic concern, and Dan and I talked about this, I said, Dan, that's more of a choice you make. That's a value. That's not really a skill. Emotional empathy, feeling what somebody else feels, intellectual empathy, understanding what somebody else feels, those are skills, competencies. They're not necessarily, necessarily value choices. Care, choosing to care about somebody, that seems like a value choice. 
be that as it may, I still sort of lean that way in terms of discussing what these things mean. But I also began to realize that empathy without empathic concern for others doesn't really matter. If I don't care how you feel, what difference if I know how you feel or understand how you feel? Can you, I hope you understand the distinction here. So even if I'm not good at emotional feeling what you feel or even understanding why you feel that way, if what I'm good at as a leader is caring about how you feel, that's the most important piece of the puzzle about why people stay and want to work for you. So empathy is a key aspect of team members and constituents. So how do we plan to teach people the importance of caring? How do we help them to be more empathic? How do we teach them the skills? <coughs> Excuse me. How do we teach them the skills of being able to identify feelings so that they understand what somebody is feeling and also teach them what to do if somebody's feeling something other than what is most important to feel for what the organization or their team or their department is trying to get done at a particular point in time. That's where emotional intelligence to me resonates in the organizational effect in this world is understanding how feelings matter, why they matter, how they contribute to your organization's ability to achieve its superordinate goals or any of its goals really. So shared feelings has become important and I'm trying to stress this in terms of how it works for team members. That's the, that's the piece about team members. Now I'd like to talk about team members' families. Have you ever worked in a place where you like perhaps where you are or you felt okay about it, but your family didn't feel like it was a very good place for you? They didn't like your organization. Why did they not like it? Maybe they turned you down for a raise or a promotion and they thought that was unfair. They gave it to somebody else who is, knows somebody's you know, is connected somehow and they didn't deserve it. Like you, lots of reasons why people might not think you're in a good place in your organization. Other concerns about the other of the organization is that they're working you too hard. There's been so many right sizings, layoffs, whatever you want to call them over the years, where people have been left with a whole bunch more things to do when others have been laid off. No necessarily uh, promotion or rewards for it, other than you should be happy that you still have a job here. That philosophy, you know, is, is worthwhile to consider. I think it's realistic. It's, it's not inappropriate. But it doesn't build any kind of engagement. It doesn't build any kind of support for the organization when you're telling people that. Instead, what you should be asking people that you've given a whole bunch more to do is what kind of support and help do you need to get all this done? That's when an organization shines. But a lot of organizations don't do that. They just give you the work. If you can't figure it out, sometimes they'll lay you off. And often, interestingly enough, they'll replace you with two people. But lots of organizations aren't thinking forward enough. So when you want to understand why families might feel a certain way, you got to treat people right. That's one thing. But what else can you be doing for the families? Have you ever been in a situation where you've seen someone with um, a family member that's sick and they're really distracted at work? Again, one of my, uh, again something that I learned from John, um, one of the things he does, is he said, you look like you've got something else on your mind today. Do you mind if I ask what it is? Yeah, i got a sick family member at home. My kid's at home. My wife's, my wife really has got to be in and out of the house. I'm really worried about. You know what John would say? Most of the time, do what you absolutely have to do and then go home. Go home and be home. You, you, your mind is there anyway. Go, go do what's the right thing to do for your family. How would you feel about that leader and that organization if that's who you work for? As opposed to, well, you deal with it when you go home when the work day's ended. Which is not wrong to say. And some people can't really leave their job because they just can't. There's something critical that's happening that they're involved with. Um, but what if in the times that you can, you make allowances for people? Sometimes people get aging parents they're dealing with, and it's a period of time. It could go on for a year or more. And it makes it really hard for them to be as impactful and as perfect as you thought they were. They're maybe just good enough now, but they're not perfect anymore. And it bothers you. How can it not bother you as a leader? 
But what if you understand the circumstance and you recognize that everybody at one point in time has family that needs something from them? And how are we as an organization showing up? What is the message we send to those families? And, and what about when somebody in the organization that helps you to create sales somehow, you know, brings you some information you weren't expecting and the salespeople close a deal that they only knew about because somebody else in the organization brought them that information. Didn't have to, it wasn't part of their job. They just overheard a conversation that suggested that somebody that could be a customer of yours that was a customer of somebody else's was unhappy with the, with the relationship. And you, they heard about that. They thought, you know what? This might be an opportunity for us to go back and revisit this customer that turned us down a year ago. And your salespeople heard about that. They got some information, went out, visited that customer, made the deal, closed the deal. And now, do you do anything for the person that brought you the information? What if you had a gift card for $100 and you told the person that what I'd like to do with the gift card is I could give it to you, but how about if we mail it to your family so they open it up, get it in the mailbox, and you get to tell them that you brought us some really useful information and we wanted to reward the family so that maybe you could take the kids to a minor league baseball game or you could go out with your partner um, and the kids maybe to a, a restaurant somewhere. Something good happens for the family or something the family needs you're able to be supportive of. Can you see ways that if you were to do that, how families might feel about you working in this place. One company that I know about is working very hard right now to get their employees to recommend family members and friends to come work for them. A lot of companies are looking for recruitment of new staff. If you were a company that did these kind of things for families, wouldn't everybody in that family be trying to recruit people to come to work for you? I gave you an interesting example of, I, I don't know if it's a great company to work for, beyond some of the things that I do know about it um, organizationally in a big in, a, in kind of a, um, a big picture perspective. I don't know a lot of people that work there, but I have seen workers and they, they seem happy, is Costco. A number of years ago, um, the Wall Street Journal reported that Costco was paying their M team members, <laughs> they was paying their team members more benefits and higher pay than competitors like Sam's or BJ's or others in that kind of business. And, um, and they were suggesting that people uh, not buy their stock or, or even short their stock, bet against them that their stock would go down because they couldn't sustain higher pay and higher benefits. I looked at that and because of the way I think and all that I've learned about emotional intelligence, I decided to make an investment in Costco when I read that. I mean, I did some other research, but that was what prompted me to do the research and make an investment in Costco, which to this day has been one of my best investments. They believed in their people. They believed in the idea of being able to pay their people as best they could afford and to take care of their people. They also had a policy about you can return anything. I, I've, I've returned a lot um, and make it easy for you. Not to question whether or not you did something wrong and whether or not you have to somehow tell people and they talk, you know, that you don't want a company to accuse you of lying somehow when you're bringing something back that didn't work for whatever reason. Uh, they've been brilliant at several of these things and as a result, they've done extremely well. So I think all companies would benefit from thinking differently about, you know, what does it mean to be cost effective? So often we look at our cost and we say all our costs or at least most of our costs are in our labor. That's the only thing that we can control. We have to have this equipment and so forth. We can't really, you know, get away from that. So how do we lower costs for people? I think it's a struggle to lower costs for people, especially if you want them to feel like team members, like they belong, and that they care about your company in a way that is so respectful and powerful that they're compelled to do everything in their power to be the best possible versions of themselves. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about on team members and their families. We'll talk more about the other constituencies another time. I'm running out of time now today. I hope you've enjoyed hopefully learning some about how the Emotion Roadmap can impact a business in a way that is very professional and also in a way that contributes to the morale and the engagement levels and the trust levels 
resulting in higher levels of profitability and productivity and people bragging about you, people caring about you as a company because you care about them. So this empathic concern that Dan introduced me to and then another friend of mine, Helen Reese, has really talked a lot about, if you want to learn a lot about empathy, look Helen up on TED Talks or on her website, Empathetics. Um, Helen is doing amazing work helping doctors and, and people in the medical field. And it's expanded to lots of other fields now too, where she is just lighting up the whole idea of how powerful empathy is in so many different ways. And I just touched on it today. I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the show today. I'll be back with you on the first and second Wednesdays of each month. I'm on from 12 to 1 p.m. This is Chuck Wolf. You've been listening to WPKM 89.5 FM, listener-supported radio. I want to thank all of you who are regular listeners. I hope if you happen to tune into the show and you had a chance to listen today that you feel like you want to tell your friends about the show. <laughs> Encourage your family members to listen to the show. The show often is a call-in show, but the phones weren't working today, so I thought I'd take the time to try and help you to understand the different ways the emotion roadmap comes to work in the way that I use it when I'm working with people, and I hope you're using it in your work life and your setting as well. Thanks, everybody. Have a great month. I'll see you next month. Bye-bye now. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.